email to post it and yeah, it's like join on. You're live. Um, so it's Tosin and the one below him. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the How to Start a Real Estate Investing Workshop. I'm Janetta Pei. I'm Ramon Torts. I'm Denisha Gray. And uh, before we get started, we're just going to do some small talk to get um, allow other people a chance to log in. We're really excited about the webinar tonight. You guys are going to get a lot of great information. Um, and this is interactive, so you will be able to type in your questions um, to us. And then same thing on our IG channels. You can also type in questions to us there too, and we'll definitely make sure we answer it because we want to make sure that you guys are getting value. And actually, if you guys can type in, if you can hear us, um, in case we need to make any adjustments there before we get into the heart of the webinar. So if you're on YouTube, if you can type in and just let us know that you can hear um, hello to the person that just said hello. Um, but yeah, if you can just type and let us know if you can hear. Okay, we see you. Thank you. All right, so before, while we're waiting for um, giving other people an opportunity to log in, we just wanted to have a little short story time. Um, <laughs> so um, this webinar series is something Denise and I decided to do like, like the first weekend may, in may yes. and it was like really impromptu and like last minute we're like you know let's just try this and see how it works out so we came up with like the different topics we were going to talk about and the first week we did it we only had like eight people that rsvp'd and we couldn't we had technical issues so we couldn't even get the live stream to start on time and thanks to everybody who was patient enough and waited like the 15 20 minutes it took for us to get it together. <laughs> so we thought we were good. So then next week, um, yeah, last week actually, um, it was our second one. So we we thought we had worked through the issues from the first one. Um, and while we were setting up for the webinar, you want to tell them what happened, Denisha? Yeah, hit by a light. <laughs> Not lightning. No, like Not a, light, a light, lightning. Yeah, a, a light. light in the studio that yes. we, um, film the webinar and it came like crashing down on her head as we were setting up and so she started like bleeding profusely it would not stop um and she was actually going to be a trooper and stay for the webinar that's why i was a little off last week if you watched last week because we had just had this whole situation and so denisha had to go to the er and you want to show them your stitches <laughs> <laughs> what we do, just some stitches right there, and then you guys can see it. <laughs> and so for that webinar, we only had like 20 people RSVP. And so we were like, okay, obviously we were having some challenges with these weekly webinars. Do we want to like keep doing them or do we just want to like give up and say, hey, you know, it's not working. And so today is our third one. We started on time, no technical issues. And as you see, Denisha's here, so she didn't get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> and our special guest, Ramon, is in the house. So, so far we're batting pretty good. But part of the reason we told the story is um, because in business and in real estate, you're gonna come up against a lot of challenges. And you have to, and hi to everybody that's saying good evening. Um, you're going to have a lot of challenges and you got to have like that persistence and that fortitude to like keep going despite everything that happens. And so we have like, I think I'm not a mathematician. That's why these two are here. Um, but from what 20 to the numbers we have now, what that's triple the number of people. More than triple. <laughs> <laughs> like five times the amount. Okay, so <laughs> we have five times the amount of people that RSVP. Um, for tonight's webinar. So we're really excited to give you guys the real estate investing information. But like I said, the story was just told to let you guys know that there's going to be challenges. To just keep going and keep growing and eventually you arrive. Um, so do we want to tell them a little bit about our uh, backgrounds and why we're here, like why we're qualified to teach this webinar? I'd start. So um, again, I am Denisha. I am an accountant. Uh, I have over a decade of experience um, dealing with real estate. I'll stick to real estate because that's what we're discussing tonight. But um, in real estate experience, um, dealing with uh, taxes as well as uh, what is it? Uh, tracking of business expenditures. So, QuickBooks. <laughs> Great. 
Uh, I'm Ramon Tooks. I am, uh, this is year 24 for me in the real estate industry uh, as an investor, developer, and educator. So I'm here to lend my expertise. And I'm Jeanetta Pay. I'm a real estate attorney and a business attorney. And I'm also a partner in the Tulsa Real Estate Fund. And I have been doing real estate transactions, working with real estate investors for over 10 years. Um, so from a legal perspective, I am very well versed in um, real estate transactions. So we have a couple of questions that we want to ask you guys. And good evening to everybody that said good evening um, that we want to ask you guys just to kind of get a sense of where you're at in the real estate investing space so that we make sure that we're giving you um, information you need tonight. Um, so Ramon, you want to kick us off? Yeah. Uh, I guess the first thing is where, where is everyone from? Uh, let us know. So if you're watching on YouTube, type in what state or city you're from so we can see. Um, because obviously real estate investing is a little bit different um, depending on where you're located. Um, so we definitely want to know that. And then same thing on Instagram. Okay, New Jersey, we see you. Look, look what's above there. The A. No. <laughs> <laughs> ATL, we see you. New York, Chicago. Okay, Chicago, All come right, through. Detroit. Okay, PA. And a lot of these um, cities that are coming through. Oh, Seattle, that's different. Yeah. <laughs> Atlanta. Okay, Atlanta, we see you. There's a lot of Atlanta people. Shy Town. We see Tampa. We got LA. We got Ohio. And we got folks from all over. St. Louis is in the house. Shout out to Sos and all over. <laughs> okay, so we, we, okay. So a lot of the cities that are coming up are really big real estate investing markets because Atlanta is a big market. Chicago is a big market. Detroit's a big market. I'm surprised I didn't see anybody from Ohio, though, because there's a lot of investment happening in Ohio. And then Florida, there's a lot happening there, too. OK. Um, oh, sorry. I, I have the questions, but really, Ramon. I can read them. <laughs> so this is something that I asked and I really want to know. Other than money, why do you have an interest in investing in real estate? Take away the money. Because we all want to make money in real estate. We all do. But other than that, why do you want to learn real estate or why are you in real estate? So type your answers in a list. You know, what's motivating you to get into real estate investing? Generational wealth. Yeah, I was going to say legacy. So everybody else with just money? <laughs> <laughs> freedom, right. no freedom, no. <laughs> okay. Financial freedom. Okay. So yeah. Um, anybody else? Why are you um, in real estate other than money? Because we all want to make money. Um, so let us know why you're in the real estate game. Okay. Financial freedom is pretty popular. <laughs> Legacy. Okay, they're going to continue to talk to you. I'm just going to step out for one second. So needing a challenge. Oh, this is a good one. To provide better housing and education for people that know nothing about owning a home. That's a good one. That's a that good is one. a good yeah, one. Provide affordable housing. There we go. Now we start to talk about it. <laughs> Boston Culp said shelter is a necessity for mankind. So we have a, a, a philanthropic way from this standpoint. Hate working for other people. <laughs> that's a good one. But that's a good one. Okay. Got that. That's a common okay, one. Okay, so based on some of the comments that have came through Ramon, um, what from a mindset perspective, what are you feeling from our audience? It's diverse. <laughs> <laughs> um, are they in it for the right reasons? Yeah, yeah. Because when you take a so avoid we, gentrification. I, I'm gonna leave that one alone. Wait, that's a, that's <laughs> an entirely different. Um, webinar. Avoid <laughs> gentrification. Know, we, we, we can't get into that. We don't, Not, have, time. We don't have time tonight. We don't have time for the gentrification piece. But it's it's a good it's a good reason. Yeah, yeah. The, the fun, it's, so mostly financial freedom. Um, generational generational wealth. wealth, financial freedom. Yeah, yeah. I like passive income. Mm -hmm. well, um, yeah. So it's pretty good. It's pretty diverse though. Okay. And so Ramon, one of the reasons why he asked that question, like you said, is to assess your mindset because real estate is 
difficult. It's not as easy as they make it seem on some of these reality TV shows where they're just flipping stuff and selling it the next day. And so your motivation for wanting to get into real estate is really going to ultimately determine how successful you're going to be in real estate. So if you're in it for the wrong reasons, like just the money, the money is not going to come like this. It's going to take some work. And so if you don't realize the money right away, you might give up. And so your rationale for wanting to do this, it's got to be more than just making money. All right. Next question. Um, is anyone already involved in real estate? And if so, how? Or if you, you know, invested prior to um, this tonight. Yeah. Like, do you already have an investment property? If you do just type in first, like, are you a realtor? Have you done any flips? Some wholesalers, realtor and a wholesaler. Yeah, okay. realtor and wholesaler, yeah. And this helps us too because then we know like how like how to tailor the information we're giving. So if you're already wholesaling, that helps us. If this is like you've never done anything before, that helps us too. Because like I said, the goal of this webinar is to make sure that we're giving everybody value and information that they can leave this webinar saying. That they learned something or they got some value. Yeah, Ozzy family says, I renovate homes for investors throughout the nation. Uh, somebody says, Yes, I'm working on my second flip. Nice. Yeah. Okay, so it looks like we have some investors in the room um, who have done a couple deals already, which is great, or um, some people on the service side who are familiar with the process. So that's really good. Um, okay, so we're 12 minutes in, so we're actually going to start getting to like the actual content, which is what you guys came here for. Um, so like I said, I'm just going to address like legal strategy, operational, technical questions. And Denisha over here is going to answer all of the accounting finance questions for you. So, I mean, this is a unique opportunity. You have like three diverse professionals here that you can talk to for free and get your real estate questions answered. And also too, if you have a question as we're going along, um, type them in on YouTube or IG and we'll answer them as you type them and you don't have to hold it to the end of the webinar. Um, so I will let Ramon take us through the outline that we've prepared for tonight. So we're going to do, uh, we're going to let Janetta handle business formation <laughs> and contracts um and then we're gonna jump over to the money expert talk about money management and she's gonna go into a little bit of detail on that but uh you know we only have so much time then i'll talk about uh several strategies um based on what we're seeing now and then i'll ask a question about which strategy uh you want to hear a little bit more about so we'll start with before you get started you better have the right business formation <laughs> Yeah. So if you are going to be a real estate investor from a legal perspective, I always encourage clients to form a company. Now, I know depending on how you're getting your funding for your deal, um, that might not be like so cut and dry. Um, so, for example, if you are getting a mortgage in your personal name, it would be a little bit challenging for you to transfer the property into your LLC because you are now personally liable for that mortgage. Um, but to the extent that you're able to create your LLC, and I always say an LLC because in real estate, especially if you're like a landlord, or even if you're like um, rehabbing, like things can go wrong. Like your tenant can trip and fall because you didn't shovel the snow or your contractor could like, suffer a massive injury while doing work and now they want to sue you because you own the property. So if you have an LLC that helps to limit your liability because then they're limited to the assets that your LLC owns. And so for that reason, I always encourage clients to um, create an LLC for as a real estate investor or if you're officially starting like a real estate investment company. And then I'll let um, Denisha from what is the best way to put a property in an LLC if you currently have a personal loan on the property? 
So what's the best way to repeat the question for everybody? So what's the best way to put a property in an LLC if you have like a personal loan on it? One of the things you can do is you can talk to your lender and see um, if they will let you um, add your LLC to the deed of the property while you still remain on it personally. And some lenders will let you do that um, because the reason why they won't let you completely 100% put it in the name of your LLC, especially if you're personally guaranteeing the loan, is because if they need to foreclose, then they want to be able just to foreclose against you. But if you can put both yourself personally and the name of your company on the deed, um, some lenders will be agreeable to that. So I would definitely say have the conversation with your lender. So the course is coming. And then, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we'll take a couple questions before we, we I guess we move on. So I'm going to let you guys like read the question and then we can answer last. Okay. Yeah, I don't have my glasses on either. <laughs> Do you handle titles for wholesalers? I in Chicago, yes, I am a attorney title agent in Chicago. So in Chicago, yes, I can do title work for real estate investors in Chicago. And I have partnered with a really good attorney in Atlanta um, that we could also do it for too. And well, we're not going to let you plug any other Atlanta attorney, but um, <laughs> if you want to talk. <laughs> If you want to talk to Ramon <laughs> offline, he knows like resources He's in, the other. <laughs> in um, Atlanta, Detroit. Like Ramon is the plug when it comes to real estate. So no matter where you live, if you need a resource, he can provide you with that information because he's connected to like other real estate investors, lenders, um, attorneys. Like Ramon is the plug. That's a good point. <laughs> um, Next question. So if you own a home in your personal name, what is the best way to go about obtaining an LLC? Um, yeah. So if you own a home in your personal name, I, I'm assuming it's like just a single family like you live in, yes. then you probably don't need to put that house in an LLC. But if it's like a duplex or something like that, where you don't live in, but you have tenants, again, like I said, um, talk to your lender. And some of the questions that are repetitive will like just jot down and make sure we readdress towards the end because we want to make sure that we're, you know, getting everybody's question answered and then also still getting through the information. On Instagram, someone asked, is an S Corp the best way to go? And I'll let Tanisha yeah. take that and, one. And that was similar <laughs> to to someone else on here asked, um, where'd it go? It's performing LLC. Uh, what uh, is if the you process? Form, okay, yeah. If you form an LLC, what is the process of ben or benefits of filing as an S corp? So, uh, I'll start with the process. The process is to basically create your entity, uh, which will be a C corp, and then you will make an election to be taxed as an S corp. The election that you will have to file is form two two five five three. So twenty five fifty three is the form that you have to file to make the S election. Um, benefits. I think that. Uh, usually in real estate, depending on how many individuals there are, you can either go S Corp or you can go partnership. Um, most of the time with real estate, partnerships are the most advised form or entity. However, if there's only one person, then L I will go LLC and it will be S Corp. Some benefits to an S Corp would be one, um, you're able to take a paycheck. So you're able to pay yourself a salary. That's one thing. Um, some other things would, I think would, I think the, the biggest thing is pay yourself a salary. I think other than that, entity wise, it's going to be the same as far as like deductions and write-offs and things of that sort. Uh, let me talk about the next one. Okay. It says, what should I be doing in my twenties to get started in real estate investing? That's a good mm -hmm. question. I wish I was investing in my twenties. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'll say this. Uh, I know. So it depends on where you are and that's, it's such a broad question, uh, and it's like a lot of what ifs. Um, but if you have time, if you have money, most of us at 20 don't have money. So, you know, partnering with other people, educating yourself, and just like really getting into the real estate arenas uh, and determining which strategy you want to use. We're going to talk about strategies later. Uh, I know a lot of people talk about wholesaling as, you know, the easiest way to get involved. Uh, that's a whole nother class again, because I don't feel that way if you're going to build a wholesale business. So, you know, in your 20s, just do what we do in our 30s and 40s, you know, just despite where you are, because if you have it, you lose it. I've 
done it a few times. Um, you just got to one, uh, educate yourself and then don't over educate yourself unless you're going to be taking action. Uh, mm -hmm. number, number two is get around the right people, uh, get into the right groups and start to network with the people that are really doing deals so that you can, you know, get infected with doing deals. So and we, we can talk about a little bit more as we go through strategies as well. And I like that. Don't overeducate yourself unless you're going to take action. Because at the end of the day, no matter what business you're in, you got to take some action. You can't just study and study and study and then like what? Got another question over here it says, "What is the importance of an operating agreement, and do you have to have one?" We're yes. get there. So we're going to get to operating <laughs> agreements, um, but let's just quickly get through how to set up your LLC, <laughs> and then we can get Some to operating questions. agreements. Um, but real quick, so um, like I said, I recommend being an LLC. That's not the magical business entity that you have to do. And I always say that it's like a specific based on your investment strategy. So how somebody else forms their business might not be like the best approach for you. And so that's why I encourage you to talk to Denisha and I like one-on-one -on -one, um, to really make sure that the way that you're forming your company is the best approach for the strategy that you're going to use in your real estate investment company. But just generally speaking, how you're going to form your LLC is whatever state that you live in, you're going to go to the Secretary of State's website. You want to check to make sure that the name that you want to use for your real estate investment company is available. And a lot of them allow you to like search the current business names that are available. Um, once you see that, then you're going to complete your articles of organization. And the main thing they're going to ask for is your business address, the name of your company, and who are the members in your LLC. So if you're a single member LLC, you're just going to put your name. And if you have like partners that are going to be in the company with you, you're also going to list them as members. Now, if you are a multi-member LLC, this is when I will say you definitely need to have an operating agreement for your real estate investment company. But if you're a single member LLC, just go by the default rules of the state. Um, but your bank may ask you to have an operating agreement when you go and open your bank account for your single member LLC. And that's like a different story. But if the bank doesn't require it, then you can just operate your LLC by the default rules of the state. Um, so once you form your LLC and you get your filed um, articles of organization from the secretary of state and the fee to create an LLC is different in each state, like in um, Georgia, it's 100 bucks. In Chicago, it's 150. Um, so it, it varies from state to state. Um, and yes, I know there's probably some questions about, well, should for tax reasons, should I form an LLC or whatever in a different state um, than the one that I currently live in? So I'll let Denisha just answer that question now. Should they file? I think that, um, depend again, it depends on your strategy. So. If your strategy is to, to buy and hold, then I, I think that it, I can't answer. It's not a cookie cutter answer, I think. I think that it's everything's about strategy and what your strategy is, and that's where Janetta gets into. If you want to have a consultation with us one-on-one -on -one and you tell me your strategy, then I can tell you the best advice for you personally. Yeah, because I know some people might say, oh, I want my LLC to be based in Wyoming because they're the taxes better. Are different. Yeah, right. but I'm going to buy all my properties in New Jersey. Right. Or you want to file in Texas, you want your business to be filed in Texas because there's no state taxes in Texas. Like, it's just totally different. Right. So, I mean, you can do that. There's different financial and tax implications with that. But again, mm -hmm. I don't want to like, and Disha doesn't want to get into that right here because we don't know what your specific strategy is but it is something you can do but just talk to a professional um, before you actually do it um, and i can want to say that i do not know the tax laws of every state so more than likely if you're asking me about a state that i'm unfamiliar with i will have to research it <laughs> so can, can yeah, I make a quick comment? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. so i know someone said should they file on their own it's it's so great that you're telling people how to file and how easy it is <laughs> knowing that you make money by doing it. So one of the things, yes, you can file on your own, but like they're saying, consult before you go file, consult with your tax professional, consult with the, your legal professional so that you understand what you're getting yourself into because at the end of the day, on the back end, they got to clean it up. So spend a little money up front, you know, getting a consultation with, with the professional so that you, in the long run, you don't end up having to pay triple, double, 10 times the amount 
on the back end. So yeah, because setting uh, it up incorrectly could cost you a lot of money in taxes at the end of the day. Um, if you had consulted with somebody, yes, it's easy to go online and do it yourself or go to like legal zoom or ink file or whatever, but they're not going to listen to your strategy and what you're trying to do to make sure that you're forming it the best way for your specific business. And Denisha and I do offer a service called business in the box where you get a 30 minute consultation with both of us. And we listen to you, we talk. And then at the end of that 30 minute consultation, we actually form your business for you. So you can go into it feeling comfortable knowing that, Hey, I have the right business set up for my business. Um, and that service is two seventy nine. And then you also have to pay the state filing fee. So if you're doing it in Illinois, it would be two seventy nine plus the one fifty dollar, one hundred and fifty dollar filing fee. So if that's something you're interested in, um, oh, well, Avery, I don't know he can uh, you can uh, book a free legal chat with me and then we can get you uh, situated with that. And Avery can drop the links on how to book a legal chat with me to set you up with a business in the box. Seems like specific. <laughs> so I, I know we got to get to this, but that's a good question. If I want to wholesale in a different state, but my physically, my physically, my company is in, uh, in Atlanta. Can I wholesale in different states from my LLC that was formed here in Georgia? Yes, you can wholesale in different states. So it's for the question, if you live in one state, but you do business in another state, can you do business there as a wholesaler? The answer to that question is yes. However, you're most likely going to have to apply for what's called a foreign business registration to do business in that state. So if you live in Atlanta and you're wholesaling in Ohio, you need to file a foreign business registration in Ohio in order to do business there because every state wants to get their percentage of the taxes for the business that you do there. And that's going to say that on the back end, you probably have to follow my multi-state return as well to pay taxes for that state that you earn money in. It's like being an athlete. Mm -hmm. You got to pay tax in every state, right? It's for every, so someone asked, is that service only for real estate or is that for every business? It's venture? for every business venture besides. So whatever business venture you're trying to start, um, business in the box, 279. And then Avery, who you cannot see, but who's moderating for us tonight, he'll make sure to drop the link in YouTube and drop the link on IG. Um, so you can just schedule like a free 15 minute consultation with me. And then we can get you set up with a business in a box consultation. And right. other question, still in relation to LLCs, is do you recommend setting up an LLC for each investment property? I'll let Denise take that question. My That's personal answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to jump in. Yeah. Like that one too. So, yeah, so I have two answers. So my personal <laughs> answer is yes. However, if you choose not to, if you choose to not set up a separate LLC for each, for each property, as an accountant, I ask that you basically keep really good records. So you keep have really good receipts. So that way, it's it's saving you money again on the back end because now your tracking system is great. So when you go to your tax advisor or your accountant, you have clean records to give to them. And now you're saving money because you're not have to pay more in time for us to sort out all of your all of your stuff. So uh, if you if you opt to not set up a different LLC per property, then you just need to have really good record keeping. And that record keeping keeping can you can either do that in Excel. Uh, Ramon has some strategies with that as well. Um, but Excel or QuickBooks or, you know, hire a professional. And, but you have to give them the data. So so my answer is yes, but no. Uh, <laughs> uh, when you're doing volume, it's, it's challenging to do that every oh, single yes. time and you have to close things quickly. Um, I say, you know, you do it with, with the commercial properties or your multifamilies. They should have their own entity, uh, your single families. And, and maybe you do it in groups. But when you're flipping, just keep it in one company because unless you have partners. If it's just you and your family, uh, that one business, then keep it there. But when you start adding partners, yes, add um, different LLCs. But it's tough because everybody on here is going to do hundreds of properties, and it's going to be tough to get hundreds of LLCs going. Yeah. And they do ask for your um, operating agreement and your um, articles of organization when you do do a real estate closing. So, you, I mean, if you have multiple, you're going to have to, like, provide that each time. You close record keeping is is absolutely key with <laughs> with real estate absolutely key 
Okay, so really quick, after you form your company, you're going to need to get an EIN number, and I'll let Denise tell you how to get an EIN number. EIN number is pretty simple, and it just goes to the IRS website, which is irs.gov. Um, and then there are some, some steps on there that will basically walk you walk through to get the EIN number. I honestly don't know the steps by heart. I, I just know how to do it. So I apologize. I'll have that for you guys next webinar, <laughs> the exact steps on how to do it, like which links to click. Or you can just pay us to do it because, again, you want to make sure you're picking the right tax election. And that's something that we can um, assist you with um, as you apply for your EIN number. We can help make sure you're picking the right tax election. Um, and that was the next thing, because even though you're an LLC, you can elect to be taxed as like uh, S Corp or partnership, which is an L LLC, but it's a partnership. You have to form a separate, uh, you have to file a separate tax return. Tax return for a partnership, which is form 1065, um, that's due on the 15th of March, or you can get a six month extension, which will make it due on September 15th. If you file as an S Corp, exact same due dates. Uh, again, it's just some 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 difference is a big difference between a S Corp and a partnership. Is uh, with an S Corp, you can take a salary. You and your partners can take salary. So uh, with the partnership, you cannot. You can you have to do guaranteed payments. So and you have to pay self employment tax on that payment. So that's another big difference between the S Corp and a partnership return is that with the S Corp, you are not subject to self-employment tax, but with the partnership, you are subject to self-employment tax on any of the earnings that you make. And that's why it's good to consult with professionals before you go and get your own EIN number. And um, uh, S Corp is a corporation, but uh, specifically for more so small businesses. So anyone that has under 100 shareholders. And then lastly, some states require you to have a business license as a real estate investment company um, or a real estate investor. So you just want to make sure that you get the appropriate business license. Right. Yeah, we're keep her in the hot seat. Right, we're halfway through it. <laughs> uh, real quick, real estate contract. So, in, um, and Ramon can speak to this too because he's seen like a lot of real estate a lot contracts. Of so many different ones, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the two key important ones that I'm just going to focus on tonight is um the purchase agreement and actually i'll let ramon because i'll just add where i think there needs to be some additional information but ramon tell them about the and it depends on your strategy too but um tell them about real estate contracts so, what you think so, you so the real estate contract there's so many different versions of it um they are normally like your real estate professionals have one and then those that wholesale have one and then those that so for, for me, I use a simple two page, three page real estate contract. But when my agents are involved, they use whatever the state contracts are, the guard farms for Georgia, uh, whatever state you're in. Most real estate professionals, realtors, realtors have their own forms. They all say the same thing. You just have to be careful about the things that you want to include. So if you're a wholesaler, you got to make sure you include things about marketing, things about access, things about being able to assign. If it's just a straight up contract, just the dates, understanding it and making sure you have due diligence in there. Uh, and I know right now in a hot time, people are taking away due diligence, but you need to make sure you have something in there about some kind of inspection or due diligence. But pretty much, you know, your name, address, make sure you got the right address, um, earns money and attorney. And from there, I mean, all of them are the same. So it's, it's critical that you understand it, read it, make sure somebody explains to you what you're signing, because simple things can affect you know, your inspection periods, um, if you get your earnings money back, how much liability you have, make sure you have the right people on your team. So an attorney and a real estate professional, a real estate agent or broker that can truly explain. If they don't know how to explain it to you, then they're not the right people for you. Yeah, you don't want to work with them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something I do for like the real estate investors I work with in Chicago, like we'll sit down, um, especially if you're first starting. Like obviously if you've been doing it for a while, you kind of know what you want in your contracts and what you don't. But typically, I'll go over the standard uh, real estate purchase agreement in Illinois with you so you understand, like, the due diligence period. You understand um, the earnest money. Um, and like Ramon said, the purchase agreement is your negotiating tool. And so for whatever kind of business you do or whatever kind of strategy you're using, you're going to want to make sure that that contract has things in there that work for what you're trying to accomplish. So... Property taxes, one, might be like an issue. Um, and that's something you can negotiate in terms of like upfront um, when you do the agreement. Um, what are some things that 
Yeah, definitely. I'll tell you a big one. Um, we hear a lot about wholesaling with no money down um, strategies. You got to put some kind of earnest money up. Ten dollars, fifty dollars, whatever it is. I I always give earnest money, whether or not I get it back from the person that's going to buy from me or not. Because if you don't have earnest money up, it's not a buying agreement. So guys, just know that when you hear it, even that's why you see a lot of people say I gave them a dollar, or ten dollars. You got to exchange some kind of money. Awesome. And that's just basic contracts, like mm -hmm. one on one. Um, they're like three things that you need to have a binding contract, <clears> and <throat> price is one of them. And so, even if it's just a minimal of like a dollar, ten dollars, or whatever, in order to have like a valid contract, you need to have some sort of price term. I think that's pretty much it on the purchase agreement, on the you know purchase and sale agreement. And then um, on the operating agreement side, like I said, um, if you're a single member LLC, I don't necessarily feel that you need one um but if you are a multi-member llc meaning two or more people in a company then you should definitely have an operating agreement because i always say you can go into business with your friend and ramon's my friend um uh, but people act different once mm -hmm. like the money starts to come <laughs> on the table and they're like oh i thought we agreed to this thing but no we really didn't agree to this thing um so that operating agreement definitely helps you guys to like be on the same page in terms of what the expectations are what the roles and responsibilities are and real estate is hard to liquidate it's not like you know you can go into business with somebody like today and then like oh my god they're strapped for cash and now they need to like liquidate and they want you to sell but you don't want to sell because the property is doing well and it's cash flowing. So how do you account for those situations? And that's what your operating agreement is going to give you. It's going to give you, and it can be adjusted based on whatever agreements you come to. There's no standard one LLC. And that's why I just encourage you to work with a professional to help you guys to draft an operating agreement that makes sense for what it is that you're trying to do. Because yes, you can find templates online, but you just want to make sure that that agreement reflects like how you guys want to split um, the profits and the losses, how you want to account for the roles, who can sign contracts, who can take money out of the bank account. Um, so that's really all I have on operating agreements. So before we move on to the money, management side of it, which is, I'm going to take yeah, notes. I know. <laughs> taking notes. Somebody asked, uh, uh, I saw something about earnest money. How much would you suggest to have an earnest money? So here's my thing about earnest money um, in an aggressive market. Be aggressive with it. Like if you have it, put it up because you're going to be competing with offers that are going to say, you know, a thousand earnest money, 5,000 earnest money, which will, as a seller, I'm going to say, you know what? If they're serious enough to put up five thousand dollars earnest money, this is probably the person I want to go with. If they want to put up a thousand, but if you put ten dollars on there and see if you're sending me a contract with ten dollars on, I'm not, I'm not even gonna take it. So uh, you know, if you're dealing with a traditional homeowner, maybe, maybe not, but people are really, really savvy, uh, especially right now in this hot market. They're Googling stuff, they're Googling you, looking at your Facebook. So you know, be as aggressive as possible and use as much as you can afford. Uh, if it's a thousand, which is kind of normal on houses under two fifty or properties under two fifty, um, give them a thousand. Uh, if you don't plan on closing, then you know you need to partner with somebody that can. If it's a great deal, because at the end of the day, people just want to know that you are going to close this deal. Mm -hmm. And in real estate, time is money, and time is of the essence. And ain't nobody got time. Like even me as a professional, I don't get paid until we close this deal, and so I don't even have time to be like, okay. Um, you might be serious. You might not be serious. Like, no. <laughs> That's a good one. The next one. Whoa. Do you need an operating agreement with the husband and wife LLC? You should. I mean, people, I mean, I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm not wishing ill on your marriage, but um, sometimes people get divorced and, um, you know, that's just the reality of the situation. Like my parents were together for 37 years and they just recently got divorced. Um, and so, yes, you should have an operating agreement um, between husband and wife. And the next question is kind of similar. It's pretty much uh, my wife is my partner in the LLC. Husband and wife consider a multi-partner. Is a husband and wife consider a multi-member multi LLC? Um, should we develop a partnership-based LLC operating agreement and partnership ta taxation? So I... On my side, IRS purposes, the IRS recognizes husband and wife as just a, like you for tax purposes. You don't necessarily have to file a partnership return. You can file 
on your personal return as an as an LLC or like single member LLC. So you don't necessarily have to file a partnership return. That's up to you. The IRS rec recognizes you as one entity. And from a dis business standpoint, you are a multi member LLC because it's two of you guys. Yeah. But when I got married, they said <laughs> you no, became one. You became one. <laughs> <laughs> well, since we're on taxation, um, let's jump right into money management. Um, and why it's critical to work with someone that can help us keep up with and all the madness. If we don't have anything on IG before we um, move on. Okay. All right. All right. So um, one of the big biggest things that people ask is why should you form an LLC? And um, I mean, the main reasons would be to one, protect your assets and two, minimize your taxes or, or both. So one of the one of the biggest things that I recommend after you form your LLC is going to the bank and open up and opening up a business bank account. Um, with that business banking banking account, you can do a checking or a savings. Um, even if, if you just start with a checking, it's imperative that you get a business debit card and also business checkbook. In our day and age, a debit card serves for everything, so it's easier for you to swipe your card than, you can, than for you to pull out a checkbook and write someone a check. Um, and then you can also get a business credit card. But with that being said, everything should belong to that particular entity. So like Ramon said, if you want to go under the umbrella of you have multiple properties under one particular entity, whenever you swipe your card, then it's best to basically make sure that you're tracking it for that particular entity or you know that expense is for that, not excuse me, not that entity, but you know that expense is for that particular real estate property. Because once it comes time to do your taxes, we have to itemize based on property. So a big thing that I recommend, again, is um, opening up a business bank account, getting a business debit card, a business checkbook. And also, if you need it, a business credit card. So that way, maybe your cash flow isn't that great. And if you have the credit, then you can, um, you know, get a business credit card to take some, alleviate some of that stress off of your cash flow wise in the beginning. Um, one of the reasons why it's important to keep. Well, let me back up. So it's important that you pay for your business items, well, your your real estate items with that particular business debit card. So you shouldn't come in with your funds. Whenever you come in with your funds, that basically makes you, if you, if you were to be sued, a person can now come after your personal assets because and because you you've commingled your your business funds with your personal funds. So they see that as one, pretty much. Like so. Um, and also, if you're, so if you're ever involved in litigation or IRS audit, it can cause problems if you're not keeping everything separated. Um, sorry, my mouth is dry. <laughs> um, yeah, what's, what's next? Uh, an example is basically like if you're sued by a tenant or a property manager and they obviously they can go after the person or the entity. But however, if everything is done under your personal name opposed to your entity name, then now they can take away your personal assets um, if you're unable to pay based on that particular real estate property. Um, another big thing is if you have tenants, if you're doing a uh, buy and hold, and so you have tenants in your property, you want to make sure that your tenants are making out their rent checks to your particular entity as opposed to your, your personal name. Um, another big thing is, I'm just going down the list, another big thing is um, per Ramon's strategy is to reinvest 20% above your mortgage back into your business. So at the end of um, once you do your your income statement, which is something I highly recommend. So income statement is basically where you would track your profit and your, your you track your profit and loss. So you take your revenue minus your expenses and that's how you get your your net income. And once you pay, you, you get your net income and so you you need to reinvest back into the business for um, maintenance, uh, wear and tear on the property you know, uh, your property taxes may increase, just anything. So you always want to make sure you put money back into the business. And just real quick, Ramon, why do you recommend 20%? Uh, that number, one, you know, because you still have taxes, uh, which, you know, you hit up to 30%. So you got to put that away somewhere. Right? You got to have some kind of operational cost. And so reinvesting means, like you said, having some savings, having some, being able to upgrade. But at some point, you're going to break even. Uh, most and we're talking about rental properties or even when you're fixing and flipping you have to have a certain amount so that it keeps growing instead of taking it spending it um when you're doing buying holes that money is not yours until that property is paid off 
Let me repeat. Even with Airbnbs, that money is not yours until that property is paid off. So every month, because if it goes vacant, what do you do? If you're spending all the money, if you're not putting away savings, if something you know major happens, insurance companies take so long. Um, tenants are going to do things to properties, and stuff just happens with normal wear and tear. You want to be able to have the money to keep that property going for 20 or 30 years uh, until the market is gone. So that 20% number is just like th that number that fits after taxes. You, you still 30 percent is taxed mm -hmm. um you know that's we're friends with the man up in the office but mm -hmm. that's a different animal um and then you know when you when you start saying take away the 30 percent you got 20 percent and then just the regular day-to-day -day operational 20 percent is a fair amount any questions about any of that no tax questions because like i said it's it's live so ig youtube if you have questions about money management and this is like the biggest part because obviously you have to manage your money right to be in business i guess what were some of your questions when you started out because for me it's like oh, it's a no-brainer but it's not a no-brainer to, so, to people so i kind of go through it but i guess what so some I, of your learned, questions? I started at 19 so i kind of learned by the mistakes that i made mm -hmm. i learned Charlie by it when, when things happened and i went to accountants and you know they said well now you're doing that wrong um okay <laughs> the beautiful budget is funny <laughs> um but it's, i started to learn how to separate which is good mm -hmm. not co-mingling having your know, separate accounts uh having a business account and a personal account and making sure you're keeping them separate because when you don't keep them separate you expose yourself to the, li the liability and the lawsuits everything else you can fix but that's why you that's why you're forming the llc one for the tax purposes and then one to protect your personal assets and, and you got to keep them separate that question how do, how do you pay yourself when you're in the real estate game right so you got this month cash flow coming in you got you just flip the property or whatever and then you because everybody talks about the whole real estate lifestyle and real estate freedom and all that, but how do you pay yourself as a result of your how do you reap re rewards now that you do that yeah. as an expert <laughs> so that's a good question that's and we'll repeat question. the question so a lot of you guys when we first started saying that you were in this real estate game because you want financial freedom and so how do you pay yourself as your properties are cash flowing and making money to make sure that you can live this financial freedom life? <laughs> so most of the time you can't pay yourself. No, I'm joking. Yes, you can. You just, again, you have to, you have to one, sit with your uh, professionals and figure out, you know, what all you have to curve for the year. Because most of the time we're not closing stuff every day, depending on what strategy you have. So one, you want to make sure you got enough to last personally through the year because if personally it's going bad then professionally it's going to go bad so um you know and these are just this is personal stuff like don't don't do what you see other people doing like don't compete with other people because you don't know what they're doing to make those deals work you don't know if they got money coming in from other places so paying yourself and sometimes they might even not have the money like they might just be renting that uh it's, it's luxury a, car or it's a lot renting. that goes with that yes. um plan ahead and so, you know, if your bills are, let's say, 2000 a month, you know, if you did a deal and made 10000 you know, just do your best to go ahead. But then you want to invest more. You want to invest as much as you can. But if you got a month or two, start putting that up ahead of time. Uh, and it's, it's, that's, a, that's a tricky question uh, because when you do a fix and flip, you know, you get that chunk, but it takes six months. So how much of that is truly your money? How much of it goes back into the business to do two fix, two fix and flips? Just live as lean as you can. That's what I'll say. Like, yeah. you, you, you know, when you're living lean um, until you got a nice nest egg, uh, you know, let's say six months, or 12 months of your salary, you really don't get paid. And it's a lot of times, like for me, I still don't get paid a lot of times from the deals because we have to keep investing and keep growing the company because you want to keep growing. You want to keep, you know, if you do a fix and flip and make 50 grand, you want to take, you know, most of it and go and if, let's say go buy, buy and hold or do two fix and flips. You just want to keep multiplying that. So paying yourself is that really really important you just want to pay that basic bill mm -hmm. stuff and i know people say pay yourself first but when you're actually doing it, it it's it's tough pay your bills first but then the extra just you know do without it and you're saying in the real estate context pay your your bills first uh, yeah, pay, you gotta pay your you gotta, well i'm saying your real estate your business personal. bills and your personal <laughs> because it can get stressful you know if you don't get that deal for four or five months um this is wholesalers too um you know, if you don't get those deals coming in consistently, then you got to make sure when you get one, you take care of yourself. For a few. So it's not stressful because if you're stressed, you're not going to do the business the, the way it should be done.
to say so. For buy and hold investors, can you explain what the security deposit <laughs> is for and why it's best to not spend it? Yeah, so and actually we're going to move into strategy. So Ramon's going to take over now right. anyways. Um, so he can definitely answer that question. And again, I um, can say for from an accounting perspective, a security deposit is considered a liability because it's technically not your money if you have to return it. So you do not want to include that in your income for the year that you collect because that's income that you're now being taxed on and you should not be taxed on that particular amount of income. And from a legal perspective, there are like a lot of regulations in whatever state you live in regarding how you have to hold that person's security deposit and then what bank account you have to keep it in. Um, so security deposits are not your money unless you're charging like a move in fee or something like that. That's non refundable. That's different from a security deposit. You want to answer hers and then we oh, have well, then this, this is a good accounting question right here. We have an IG says okay. if I have expenses like training and books. If I accurately track them, can they be claimed as business expenses if, if I don't have a business account yet or I can't claim expenses until I get a bank account, a business bank account? That is a good question. And so to repeat it for YouTube, if you are learning how to do real estate, like let's just say um, you bought some books, you attended some training courses or whatever um, before you officially formed your company and opened up your business account, can you write it off on your taxes, Denisha? <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you technically, if you don't have a business, how are you writing off a business expense? That's, mm. that's a cut and dry answer. <laughs> say, that, say that again. Say if, that again. If you do not have a business, how are you writing off a business expense? So you need to form a business number, sir. And I'll say this from what I hear is not my expertise, but because of the rules that are in place right now from our current president, you should have a small business to write out. You can benefit a lot more during these times based on what's coming or what has happened over the past four years. So um, is that? That's, that's correct. So not getting too deep into it, but um, under the Trump administration, there was something passed called like the Section 199A, where um, you businesses get a 20 percent uh, they qualify for 20% deduction, business deduction. So that, that can benefit you all and also lower your tax bill. Um, with that being said, there's some caveats to it and some income phase outs to it as well. And then there's also some stipulations for accountants, lawyers, uh, uh, <laughs> medical professionals, and uh, things of that sort. But real estate professionals, you, you benefit from this. Now, is that retroactive? Like she, like she bought her books and her trainings? Is she still able to apply that after the LLC or is it a, is a new? It's te so technically, your cat. Most of the time, you're a cash basis taxpayer, meaning so it's for that particular year that you purchased it in. Yeah. So we got two more tax questions. All right. So for for wholesalers still working in nine to five and working for yourself, do you have to file separately? What do you mean by file separately? So I, I mean, oh, so if you're like wholesaling is your side hustle, and yeah. then your you main hustle. Five, yeah. yeah. So if you have a, if you're a wholesale, you're, let's say you're a single member LLC wholesaling, so that's your business. So you're you still have a nine to five. So your nine to five is your W two. That's a totally separate line item from your wholesaling income. So technically, yes, you are supposed to report that income. And if you are a single member LLC, you can be taxed as a sole proprietor, which means that you will file form Schedule C on your regular personal individual income tax return. So it's just a separate schedule on your individual income tax return. And with that being said, if you do have an LLC in for the wholesaler, you can also write off expenses in relation to that particular business. So whether that's mileage going back and forth to, to properties or just whatever, you know, not whatever, but some, some expenses that you incur in regards to your wholesaling business. All right. So we're going to jump into strategies right. um, <laughs> um, because I know we, we have a ton of tax questions. And that, that's, a, <laughs> that's, a, that's another class. All right. Um, somebody just asked, is there an advantage to having a real estate license uh, to assist real estate investing or is having a license unnecessary? So that's a strategy question. Yeah, that's a strategy question. So I, I'll start there and then I'll talk about the different strategies. So I won't say that there is an advantage, but then there is an advantage. Um, having a real estate license, we get asked that a lot. The the downside is you have to disclose everything.
thing. So if somebody asks you a question, you're talking to a seller about the value, you got to tell them. For us as traditional investors, I don't have to tell you. That's kind of on you. Um, but that license, you know, can be used so many different ways. You can use that license to make commissions, to invest yourself. Uh, we do a class called uh, Agents Are from Venus, Investors are from Mars, because it's such a huge disconnect when you're talking to investors and real estate, real estate agents or brokers. And so I would say, you know, the advantage of being a real estate agent that understands investing, um, you can assist your clients more and you can build your own wealth while you are servicing traditional clients. All right. Um, let's see. Somebody asked Somebody, about tracking expenses. Yeah, I saw that earlier. Um, someone asked the question of what is the best tool program to, to track real estate expenses that will make our accountant's job easier? Um, simple, I guess simple tasks would be Excel, QuickBooks, FreshBooks. There's a lot of accounting programs out there that you can track it or from a actual investor's perspective. What do you so so I'm an Excel person. I'm real I'm really simple. Um, but we like I told you, we just looked at a new software. It's so much stuff that they have apps. It's going to depend on, you know, how easy it is for you. Excel always works because mm -hmm. uh, you can export it. You can send it to people. You can. It's easy to track it because you can just do it from anywhere. Uh, if you're not good at Excel, then I, I don't know because I am. And I'm like the least technical person in the world. Well, and, I don't know. I just met you today. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and from a, from a non-accounting perspective, where if you don't have an actual, if you don't actually hire a bookkeeper, Excel will probably be best because if you use a program like QuickBooks and you're not tracking the expenses adequately, then we now have to go back and clean up your clean up your inefficiency. So it's probably better to use Excel and just put really good notes in there um, and make sure you keep the, the receipts or, or actually forget receipts. If you get a business bank account, you get a business debit card, just provide your accountant with your bank statements. So strategies, let's jump into strategies. Um, most people think about buying whole, wholesaling, fixing and flipping. But let me just say one that is like the cornerstone. Uh, all of us should be homeowners. Um, and that's one of the best ways to become an investor. Even if you buy something small and move up, um, talking to your real estate professional, your attorneys about making sure you become a homeowner, uh, whether you buy a duplex living in one side, whether you buy a two bedroom house. Uh, I think we're getting away from building wealth from, you know, if a house is small. Like my grandma's house was four rooms. And I think we had 20 cots and two mats and a sofa, um, but we were all, that's how they built wealth because they owned a home and most, most people, grandparents lived in town. So start, start there, start thinking about how do I become a homeowner? Because if you want to be a long-term investor, um, you know, the things that apply credit savings, all those things apply. Um, so that's my, I always say that's my number one strategy to doing it because you can move next year. You know, this market has been so hot. Days have jumped, you know, 10 to 15 percent in six and 12 months. So it, it's a it's a really good way. And you can get in with less money now a lot of times. But other than being a homeowner, um, wholesaling, buying and holding and fixing and flipping. Um, I want to see. I know we had a few wholesalers here. Wholesaling, I'll start with because most people say that's the easiest way. And give us a thumbs up if you're a wholesaler so we can see how many wholesalers there are. We have we have Tosin on here. Yes. yes. And same thing on IG. If you're a wholesaler, give us a thumbs up so we can kind of gauge the room. I think wholesaling is tough. You got to really have that yeah, hustle about you. Yeah, you got to have that hustle about you for wholesaling. Yeah. If you, are there, how many people are <laughs> confirming that they're wholesalers on IG? We have about three, four. Okay. okay. So here, here's my, my thought uh, on the different strategies. They're all really based on your resources and that's time, money, and your, ne and your network. Um, wholesaling is a way to get involved, but you got to have the right mindset to be a hope to have a wholesale business. There's a difference in somebody that's going to wholesale a deal and somebody that has a business that's going to go out and make a living off of just doing wholesaling every day. Um, with wholesaling, if you don't know what wholesaling is, wholesaling is um, where you're basically going out, finding a property for another investor and you're getting paid a fee. Uh, you're controlling that property through a contract and then assigning it or double closing it, um, you know, buying it, turning around, selling it basically at the same time to uh, an, end, an end buyer that's going to do buy and hold and fix and flip. It. Um, the reason why people say that it's easy because you can do it without any money. It doesn't depend on your credit and have anything to do with your educational background. It's just understanding the process and connecting to people. Now, and the plug. 
Yeah, you got to be the plug. Mm -hmm. You got to be the plug. And you got to go out there and really work. Now, I uh, disagree with most people when they say it's the easiest way to get involved in real estate investing, because if you're going to do it as a business, it takes a lot. It takes money to market. It takes money to have your, you know, your softwares together. Um, your phone wanna, systems. Your phone systems, the people that are going to help you. It's not that it's any, any more difficult, but it's not as easy as some people make it seem. Um, my statistic is, you know, 90% of the wholesalers are not going to make it. And I know I get a lot of flack about saying that, but it's the truth because most people don't want to take the time to build that system. Um, most people after, you know, three months of nothing happening, uh, they, they say it doesn't work and, you know, and it's, and it's difficult. So, uh, wholesaling is, is a good way to get involved in real estate, but it depends on where you're coming from, how much time you have, what kind of cash you have, what kind of network you have. Uh, if you're working a nine to five and, you know, you got a lot going on after work, wholesaling could be very difficult for you just because you don't have the time to put into it. Um, so that's strategy one. I like wholesaling. Um, I, you know, I've wholesaled quite a few deals and I wholesale now because I have people around me that need deals. But if I had it my way, I would probably never wholesale if it's a good deal. <laughs> and I mean, it's true. If it fits that formula, um, this is, you know, up to 70 percent of. Uh, what it would be worth after you renovate it, which is the ARV, then, you know, we can just figure out a way to do it ourselves. So, you know, that's what you're competing against, those people that do the business and why it's so challenging because you got people from all over the world who are looking for deals that will pay a little bit more. And in this market, you have savvy, really educated uh, sellers, homeowners and sellers that, you know, they don't want to go into that that amount, 65 to 70 percent, uh, the numbers that we need. So wholesalers are having a very difficult time right now. And the only thing I'm going to say from a legal perspective about wholesaling, if you want to know about double closing, that's a whole nother webinar, but just make sure that the purchase agreement you sign with your, um, to get the property under contract gives you the ability to assign that purchase agreement to your end buyer. Because if you don't have the ability to sign, assign it, then basically you're putting yourself on the hook for that, that, con that contract. So I'm going to ask a question, um, the beautiful budget, what part of Ohio and then Janetta can, can link you up to somebody? In Ohio? So yes, they're in Ohio. Yeah, they say you have a wholesaler in Ohio. Well, we don't want you. Yeah, I know. Oh, uh, well, you can plug in. You know him too. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I want to know what part of Ohio, though. Uh -huh. they, you know, Akron. Akron. Yeah. Yeah. Columbus, Akron. So um, one of the best wholesalers in our network and one of the best in the country will be Beyond Win. Um, look him up. He's on all the social medias. He's a great person, great guy, very inspirational, and he can, you know, he can get you some good deals. And the win is W Y N N. And that's really his name, Beyond. <laughs> um, <laughs> for you, <switch> <laughs> all right, so strategy two, um, buy and holding. Um, I love it. It is, you know, it's been the, the thing since the beginning of real estate investing. You know, you're going to have your ups and downs, so values will change. But if you do it right, if you renovate it properly in the beginning, whether it's, it's single family, residential, or multifamily, or commercial, it's all the same. It's buying and holding. Um, to be successful with buying and holding is to know what to expect up front, making sure you save the right amount, and making sure, you, I mean, any of this stuff, buying it right. But on your buying holes, don't gamble too much. Like, just know that we're going to buy it right and we're going to renovate it with the best quality of renovation so that we don't have so many, you know, issues throughout um, us owning it. And then making sure we save the right amount so that we can renovate and keep it up uh, during the process. But I, I love buying holding because that's what's going to build that generational wealth. That's going to take care of that passive income. That's going to create that financial freedom and the tax benefits of buying and holding is tremendous but you know we don't appreciation but we're not that's a whole other class we're over the hour so um uh, buying and holding i encourage everybody to buy and hold um wherever you are you can buy and hold in other cities other states you just got to make sure again you set up the right uh llc's the right corporations uh to protect yourself and have the right insurances uh and that's that's something that you can do a class on insurance What's the proper insurance when you're buying and holding? What kind of liability? What kind of deductibles? Um, but 
you got to know all of that when you're talking about I'm going into a buy and hold. All right. Um, and then fixing and flipping. Um, buying holding, uh, contrary to popular belief, is my favorite strategy. I know a lot of people say fix and flip um, because we, you know, we do quite a few of them. But fixing and flipping is like really cool. Even today, I get excited about each fix and flip until I get a problem. But <laughs> then I still get excited. But fixing and flipping is a way to um, to raise chunks of cash in a you know, and I'll sell six to twelve month period uh, where you go in, you buy, you have to buy it right. That's easy because if you're working with the right professional. You can get, you know, you can, you know, you get your appraisal. You have a real estate agent that you're going to be working with that's going to tell you what they can sell it for, what you should be buying it for. So you'll you'll know what you should pay for and what you should sell it for. Uh, the biggest issue with fixing and flipping are the contractors, uh, managing contractors and overruns and, and you know going over budget and over time. And that you know today we I still run it, I still do it, but we minimize it. And that comes from picking the right teammates, understanding the construction part of it. Uh, a lot of people don't want to get involved in it. Now, I'm not saying go out and paint yourself um, because probably the return of your time is not as, as great as it would be if you're doing multiple jobs. But you got to understand that process. Um, sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. Uh, but you learn from every deal. Uh, and so I've had jobs recently where, you know, we didn't make what we wanted to make, but we learned something different even after 24 years. And it makes you better for the next deal. It does. But like we said, we had challenges just getting here today. So <laughs> you and we got better. Let's see. Uh, so, um, hey, Claus, how you doing? So that that twenty percent, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw that twenty percent into that when you're talking about your buying holes back into your nest egg. That's what she was talking about earlier. Um, because after you you know you do your maintenance and everything, you need to have that twenty percent somewhere um, just in case you run into an issue. And yes, uh, beyond win, W Y N N. So, um, here's a question I became a homeowner this year, and the process piqued my interest in investing, mainly flipping. How can you use your own home to help you start flipping? So, if you have equity, if you just bought this year, um, I don't know if you have equity or not, if you can do a line of credit, but uh, if you had the ability and you will find you could finance something you probably can go out and get some type of finance to help you start flipping you just got to figure out a way that you have some savings um to put down and carry a fix and flip because it's going to be vacant so you're going to have you're going to have a second mortgage uh, unless you have cash in your 401k ira and you know uh, funding again we can get really deep into that just we don't have the time tonight Let's see okay, okay. Uh, yeah, beyond it with awesome. <laughs> um, I have a question just from a from not being a professional. Right. So when you first started out, how did you um, like with contractors and normal contractors do? How did you burst yourself in that space and just doing it for contractors doing a, a great job or not? So so when I first started, I was uh, a bird dog, which is um, what wholesalers are right now has just become a little bit more like they became a little bit more professional. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot through trial and error. There weren't a lot of classes. You had, you know, 24 years ago, you had Carlton Sheets and you had a Ron LeGrand and then everybody else was kind of like, just kind of fly by night people. I can tell you, I remember Carlton Sheets. With that, with cassette, that, that. cassette. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's all you had. And so a lot of us did not have the groups, all the different reels. You had a couple of reels around. So I learned a lot by doing it. Okay. Like I jumped right in and did it. And so, you know, I had some good people around me. I asked a lot of questions. Um, you know, it's the same thing. You're just getting estimates, and then you're going to lose some. You're going to win. Again, you're going to lose some. You're going to learn something, right? And so when the times came where people not really ran off of stuff but did bad work, I could see it myself. Okay. So I just didn't pay them. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, you just, I mean, you got to have that written in agreements. And there was times where I didn't have agreements. I kind of shook hands and said, paint my house, I'll pay you. And then, you know, then they didn't caulk it or something that looked bad. And then we have to argue about it. What we're providing, you, your contracts. you got to get your contracts together. You got to make sure you educate yourself on the on the entire process so that you don't have those issues. You're going to have some issues, but just not those issues. Okay. Do you recommend any classes for insurance from the insurance aspect of buying and holding? 
So I don't, I don't know about classes. It's just you need to talk with different insurance agents um, because they all can tell you something different of what you go into an insurance policy. And some some properties are just you're going to have certain types of policies. So with fixing and flipping, you're going to have builders risk policies, and they, they're all so different. With buying and holding, you need to have certain kind of policies. But as a company, as your LLC, you need to have some liability insurance on your company and yourself. So those are things that I would talk to whoever you're, you know, dealing with with your insurance professional. Let's see, I just saw when it moved. If you focus on fixing That's and flipping, it. should you create your own construction company to help mitigate costs as a general contractor? <laughs> so, um, if you are a general contractor, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so you could. Uh, but you got to have the power then to manage the general contracting company because that that's a whole nother company and your uh, fixing and flipping the side of it of managing the fixing and flipping. So so the answer could be yes or partner with a good GC. You know, there's some good GCs out here. Now, do you want to cut that? If you're doing volume at some point, you want to cut that fee. Uh, maybe I'm not going to tell you everybody wants to manage all the people that work on a job site. Depends on your time. And sometimes it saves you money working with good professionals. Um, so don't be afraid to like invest up front. Yeah, yeah. Let's see, uh, experienced investor that took ten years off and worked long hours on job need a good source for wholesale properties to fix and flip and buy and hold. What is the best resource? Where are you? What city, state? Yeah, uh, and that is baby brother. So why, while we're waiting on baby brother to respond. And um, um, I know I know Ramon has a heart because he we, we all be working. <laughs> um, so so the fact that y'all talking to us right now for free, like we all really be working. Um, and, and we definitely want to provide value. So I don't want you guys to feel like, oh, my God, like, you know, why? No, that's not why I'm saying that. But I do also want to be mindful of Ramon's time um, because time is money. Um, but we also want to make sure that you guys are getting value and information. And so um, think of any like last minute questions that you guys might have about just real estate investing in general that we didn't cover for you. Um, so that way we can start asking. So for, for the three of you, as we close up, we wrap up. How can people get in contact? How can people get in contact with you? We, we have a lot of questions across different verticals. different. Baby areas. Russell, what city are you in? Yeah. Um, so the way that they can reach me, um, if you're trying to reach me on social media, um, my social media handle is at J-P-A-Y-E-E-S-Q. I do respond to like, don't DM me on Facebook though, because I don't, I don't do Facebook Messenger. Um, but <laughs> you can DM me on IG or you can send me an email at um, info, I-N-F-O at jpaye.com and i usually get back to emails within 24 hours or you can go to my website www.jpaye.com and you can book a free 15 minute legal chat um, with me and we can talk on the phone um, about whatever questions that you may have so those are like the three best ways to reach me dm me on instagram at jpaesquire or jpayeesq um, info at jpaye.com or my website www.jpay.com and schedule a free legal chat. So it's easy easier for me if you uh, DM me as well on Instagram. I'm Ramon Tooks, R A M O N T O O K E S, uh, across all social media. But if you DM me, I will respond. It may take 48 hours or so, but I'll get back to you. And my Instagram name is gray, G R A Y underscore financial. Um, and that's on Instagram. I am the same as uh, Janetta as I have Facebook, but I check my Instagram DMs a lot more frequently than, <clears throat> excuse me, than Facebook. And then if you have a direct question, if uh, Instagram doesn't work, then you can email me directly at dgray, D-G-R-A-Y, at gray-financial.net. So um, what's next? Um, what do we, what, you know, how can, how can we all work together? Well, um, before we do that, did you let's do the wrap up okay. questions before okay. we get there? So, yeah, it's just, a, uh, just I guess there's a couple of other wrap up questions. Um, uh, how are you guys staying sharp? Is there any kind of resources or tools in the city that people could just help stay connected and 
ingrained and continue to matric you know matriculate in their real estate career? For me, um, I from a legal perspective, like you know, laws are always changing and stuff like that. So I always attend like different legal webinars and workshops just to help to keep me well versed in the real estate space and then i also attend like i've been to a few of ramon's um workshops just to learn from a practical standpoint um about real estate investing so that i can be a better attorney um to the real estate clients that i work with uh, for me same thing I'm, I'm a member in most of the real estate investment associations but i also go to a lot of different small business events because i want to learn about the tech side i want to learn about the legal side um and then i want to make sure i'm up to up to date on whatever's happening in our communities like what's what's happening with the city what's happening with you know what new projects are coming so just get involved in as much as you can and go to and most of this stuff is free um you know as far as like the cities um but you know the rears you spend a little bit of money so just get involved read listen get on webinars uh like tonight and just learn as much stay you know weekly do something and read the newspaper because there's a lot of like real estate um, stuff happening in your city that, you know, can help you stay up to date on if you're reading like, you know, the local newspaper and stuff. Same. Um, I do a lot of continuing education. I read books that uh, are CPA driven or uh, written by CPAs. And then also I attend webinars and seminars and, you know, bigger pockets and other resources there's there's a lot, a lot of, of online there's a lot of re free resources out there you guys just do your homework is there are there any books like in particular just even if it's one from each, each of you all one book that every serious real estate investor should read or podcast or whatever but just that one that you would just highly recommend that kind of got you in the game or just kind of took you took your growth out of here in terms of whether it be from a mindset strategy standpoint or a strategy standpoint like what is one book or one one webinar podcast whatever that you recommend that people kind of plug into. Well, this isn't like real estate investing per se, but um, Robert Kiyosaki's book, um, learning the four quadrants and how you move through them um, was just from an investment standpoint gotcha. um, was helpful to me. So I'm going to say Flipology by Ramon Tooks. <laughs> <laughs> um, but other than that one, because uh, that one's focused on fixing and flipping. And how can they get the book? And you can go on to universityofwealthbuilding.com and purchase the book. Um, my other, a book that I really, really uh, have enjoyed lately um, has been uh, Hal Elroy's book. Um, Kylie, I just went blank. It's by Hal Elroy. It's, it's, it's a journal that talks about what you do every single day in the morning. Um, and I just again, went blank. So Google Hal Elroy. You'll, you'll see which one it is. I'm, I thought Ebony was on here. She normally would take my blank spots away but it's gone so but yeah look up how Elrod he has a really really good series of books uh, that talk about doing everything really really early in the morning uh, that I enjoy doing so and I think for me uh, I obviously am different I am all about a cash flow budgeting so one of my favorites is uh, Dave Ramsey podcast that I always listen to um, and then book wise real estate driven is uh, for me again um, Accounting world is the I think it's called like the savvy tax, so like tax strategies for the savvy real estate investor or something like that. Um, and I don't know who wrote it, sorry. But if you give, if you Google like it's like the tax the tax strategies for the savvy real estate investor, and savvy is like savvy, <laughs> exaggerated. <laughs> but they just need you to be savvy, right? <laughs> Next. All right, because we're words, closeouts, advice, the whole nine. Take it away. Um, just general advice. I would say, um, obviously, you see, there's three of us here tonight, and we all bring different knowledge and expertise to uh, real estate investing. So I would just say, really invest in the right team of people around you as you get into your real estate investing career because your team can really like make or break you. I agree with that. Um, so to add on to that, you'll hear me talk about taking action. Um, we all make mistakes. So don't be afraid of making a mistake. Um, be afraid of like not doing anything. Like that's like the worst one. I know you guys see it just, you know, next year saying, you know, I have a new year's resolution. I want to invest in real estate. 
go be an assistant to somebody, go do an intern, go like drive somebody around. Like don't ask somebody to pick their brain, like, you know, and sit down with lunch, go figure out how to do something every day with somebody else, even if it's for free for a while, but do something. Uh, don't continue to say, well, I want to, I'm going to try to, or my goals are just pick one and do it. And, you know, it, with the right team, um, with the right information, you will be fine. And piggyback off that, my, my word would be just be intentional. So intentionality with, with all things that you do this year. And then quickly, we'll take some last minute questions and then we'll tell you how you can work with us, all three of us, later. So IG, if you have any questions, shoot them in. YouTube, this is your chance for last minute questions. IG, YouTube. Yeah. All right. So how you can work with us. So if you found value in the workshop tonight and give us a thumbs up, if you got um, value from all three of us. So before you type in any more questions, just let us know if you got some value tonight, give us a thumbs up. Um, so we are, and I, you're going to have to say the date cause I can't remember. Um, but we see that there is like, a demand or desire for the information um, based on the number of people that RSVP for the webinar tonight. We had close to 200 people um, RSVP for this information. And it's very rare that you get to talk to three knowledgeable and experienced professionals. And so we decided that even though we're all busy, um, we're going to keep this party going. Um, and so Ramon, how are we going to keep the party going? So June 26th here in Atlanta, we're going to do a live event. Uh, from six to nine. But you can also, we'll also have a streaming available if you can't make yes. it in person. Um, and, you know, it's just going to be next level. So this was kind of intro. Uh, we can always do intro, you know, but we want to make sure that we get you guys going in the right direction and on track to whatever goals you want to. You wanna, financial freedom? Yep, yeah, financial freedom, passive income, generational wealth. Uh, and so on June 26th, which is a Wednesday, uh, even again, um, you know, we'll send out where uh, it's going to be. Um, and how to harvest your people, but that that is next level. So in between now and then, I'm gonna say DM, reach out to everybody. They have an awesome business in the box, guys. I, that price is like, I was like pinching her up under the table, like say something different, because for somebody to do all that for you guys and give you this free, you know, I don't know where else you get it from. So, uh, but June 26th, we're all in a room together. Uh, so come out with us. Too. But unfortunately, it's going to be like a fee. So we're That's looking fortunate. at like, well, <laughs> we're looking at $47 for the one on um, June 26. 26 from six to nine. But like I said, if you're not in the Atlanta area and you can't join us in person, we will still offer it online. But the reason why we're adding a fee to that one is because we're going to elevate the information that you're going to get. Um, and it's going to be like real valuable information that now you can take and you can leverage and you can use in your real estate investing business. Cause a lot of you guys had some specific tax questions. A lot of you guys had some specific strategy questions and I didn't even talk about double closings. Um, and so, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. And you had like some, um, property insurance questions. And so for this next one in 30 days, you're going to be able to get like more specific information. And so that's why it's going to be the $47 fee. Thank you, Ebony. It's Miracle Morning was the book I was talking. I told you she always, they always make sure <laughs> my brain works right. <laughs> and we want to thank you guys for taking time out of your night um, to come and learn and engage and interact with us um, and just investing in yourselves. Yes. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. <laughs> so if there's no more questions. YouTube, Instagram, we're out. Have a good night. And spring morning. All right. What was the